In the spring of 1812, London suddenly discovered its first great superstar, a 24-year-old poet, Lord Byron. His name was synonymous with danger and seduction, beauty and mystery. Every society hostess now wanted Lord Byron at their party. I've been tracing the footsteps of the man who thrilled and scandalized Regency London. Byron's first great foreign adventure was driven by a lust for life and an omnivorous sexual appetite. I followed his journey, meeting Portuguese ladies of the night, wild men of Albania, to Turkey, the land of sodomy and sherbet, before discovering revolutionary fervor in Greece and sowing the seeds for the tragic early finale of his life. Byron had returned to London with Child Harold, the steamy, semi-autobiographical poem about his travels. It was an unprecedented publishing sensation. Overnight, he became indelibly famous, and the cult of celebrity was born. But fame was a poisonous flower, a deadly nightshade. It bloated and already enlarged ego. Its poetic perfume was soon overpowered by the stench of raw scandal, as Byron's whole life was about to be held up for public scrutiny, exposing dark whispers of insanity, alcoholism, sodomy, and incest. Soon, Byron would have to leave town. I'm going to follow his flight from scandal into exile on the strangest and most extraordinary adventure of them all. My first brush with Byron was something I read by Elizabeth Longford at school when I was 15. She described how one summer's afternoon in 1933, two local vicars set off through a leafy village to an ancient church to exhume the body of Byron. Breathless with excitement, they removed the lid. Only to see that Byron's body was almost perfectly preserved. They noted with some surprise that he had an enormous erection of gigantic proportions. This hard-on, which had lasted since 1824 when Byron had died, must surely have been some kind of a record. I was hooked. Byron's sexuality both drove him and got him into trouble. With his newfound fame, women swooned for him at every turn but his extravagant lifestyle meant he was always broke. So in September 1812, he proposed to Annabella Milbank, a serious young heiress. To his horror, she turned him down, writing that Byron's lips concealed an inner sneer. But Byron didn't like rejection. He persisted, and a year later, they married. The novelist Edna O'Brien, who knows a thing or two about shocking her readers, has made a recent study of Byron's love life. It's you. It's you. And in particular, his doomed bid for nuptial bliss. The wedding itself was um, uh, not auspicious. They got into a carriage for the honeymoon, and on the way there, Byron vowed uh, that he would punish her for having refused him. So he put terror into her. He was delighted to tell one of his many friends that uh, he had Lady Byron on the sofa before dinner. Well, now we come to the nighttime sleeping arrangements. He said um, he was used to sleeping alone, but um, if she wished to sleep next to him, she was as good as any other animal, provided it was young. I mean, that was not very romantic. I think girls like her being so uneducated about something like sex, and that he having this shock tactic propensity for sodomy. I always imagine, my fantasy is that when they got to the house and he has her in, on the couch, that he actually just lifts up her dress and has her up the bum. Good hooray girl that she was, she probably enjoyed enormously laughing like a barrel every time he upended her and slapped her bum and like, you know, 
I believe that she gets quite into sex with him and stuff like that. Yes, she wrote that um, she uh, that they had sex even when she was uh, menstruating, and there was a slight element of boast in it. Mm. His her sexual life with him was probably great mm. for her. That was taken away in her mind and subsequently in in reality by his love of his half-sister. Augusta Lee was Byron's half-sister and had secretly shared his bed for at least a year before his marriage. She was now a frequent guest in the marital home. And Byron wrote of their relationship, I am much afraid that that perverse passion is my deepest. And now pregnant Annabella was obliged to watch hopelessly as the pair of semi-siblings frolicked like children in a fallen paradise downstairs. Annabella gave birth to their daughter, but within weeks, after terrifying rows and undeniable sexual violence, the marriage was over. She denounced him and hinted both at incest and marital sodomy. The Daily Mail du jour had a field day, comparing him to Nero and Caligula. Friends abandoned him, even jealous ex-lovers joined in, divulging Byron's confidences that he had seduced three boys at Harrow and had corrupted his page, Rushton. Cheers, thank you very much. Strangled by debt, ostracized by society, and in real fear for his safety, for a man as dramatic as Byron, there was only one option, exile. As soon as he left, I think there was just an enormous weight off his shoulders. Uh, he felt free. And that is uh, what travel does to you. It makes you feel free from the burdens of your own life. On the morning of 25th of April, 1816, Lord Byron left England for the continent. He would never see his wife, his daughter, or his sister again. But where others might have felt the weight of shame, Byron smelled freedom, and he was going to enjoy it in style. Okay, Michael, where's the limousine? Oh my God, it's not that. Here's the thing. Byron had a huge coach made, a copy of Napoleon's own coach. It was green, it had NB <clears throat> for Noel Byron or Napoleon Bonaparte on the side of it. It had a bedroom, it had couches, it had kind of jacuzzis, everything. And this is what I'm left with. Byron's London possessions had been seized by bailiffs, but his coach had escaped. He set off in private luxury with baggage and servants in another carriage. <laughs> Beluga. There's lots of key words here. Where is the beluga? Is that inside? Maybe, this, maybe it's going to get better inside. Come on, everyone. Landing in Ostend, Lord Byron fell like a thunderbolt upon a chambermaid. At Waterloo, he picked up souvenirs from the recent battle. While England celebrated a famous victory, Byron, the anti-monarchist, mourned Napoleon's defeat. And from the Rhine, he sent word to London for more condoms. Buongiorno a tutti, benvenuto a bordo. Io mi chiamo Barbara, sono il torno guide. E, uh, As Byron's exotic circus caravan rolled through Europe, notoriety preceded him. Announced in local papers, he provoked alarm and fascination in equal measure. Inspired anew, poetry began to pour from him. I think the genius of Byron was to encapsulate this in words, and the dwarfing of the human ego by nature. And his ego was particularly gigantic and uh, complicated, and, um, and he was driving that ego all the time because part of him was just concentrating on being Byron and uh, being more fabulous and more depressed and more shocking. Uh, but on the other side, he had, I think, you know, this genius to sketch in words what he saw. All which expands the spirit, yet appalls gather around these summits as to show how earth may pierce to heaven, yet leave vain man below. Hmm. Byron was all too human. 
And when he reached the shores of this mountain lake, he would form another complex web of creative and sexual relationships that would fire the world of literature and bring scandalized accusations of a league of incest. Never one to do anything by halves, Byron rented the impressive Villa Diodati perched over Lake Geneva. Staying nearby that spring was another poet, Percy Bysshe Shelley and his wife Mary. The Shelleys had a reputation for indulging in free love. Their endless presence up at the villa turned his new home into a mecca for Byron groupies and thrill seekers. Byron scholar Corin Throsbury has made a meticulous study of Byron's fan mail. This was a place that Byron came to escape. But in fact, I don't know quite where it was, but the Hotel Angleterre, um, I guess, was over there. And that's where they rented binoculars to English tourists so that they could um, spy on what was going on here in Villa Diodati. He came here very much to kind of escape that and uh, to really concentrate on his work. You know, he had no choice but to leave London at that time. And it followed. And yet it followed in this, in this figure of Claire, and I think she was a woman who knew what she wanted, and uh, she wanted Byron. One of Byron's most persistent groupies, Claire Claremont, who was a bit of a bunny boiler, joined him with the Shelleys at Villa Diodati. Byron had received a stream of florid correspondence from Claire since his heyday in London. The fact that Claire had already had an affair with Shelley and that she was Mary's stepsister added extra heat to an already spicy mix. Her letter's actually really similar to the hundreds of other letters that he received, although significantly bolder, as you'll see. Um, you know, she really kind of pushes for a meeting in a way that the other, other fans don't quite so much. Um, she writes, An utter stranger takes the liberty of addressing you. It is earnestly requested that for one moment you pardon the intrusion, and laying aside every remembrance of who and what you are, listen with a friendly ear. It is not charity I demand, for of that I stand in no need. If you feel your indignation rising, oh, let me look if at you feel <clears> them, <throat> where is it? Oh. If a woman whose reputation has it remained unstained, if without either guiding or husband to control, she should throw herself upon your mercy, if with a beating heart she should confess the love she has borne you many years, could you betray her? Do not decide hastily, and yet I must entreat your answer without delay. <laughs> God, she is very, very pushy. They felt they had some kind of connection to him, mm. and that his. That's the extraordinary thing. They felt they had a connection. People read these poems just like uh, you buy, you know, a U2 album, and you feel this connection with the writer. That it's a sexual, emotional connection. That you're the kind of you're the woman for them. And then we get people like Claire Claremont arriving on the scene. With all the possibilities posed by this kinky little foursome, it's a wonder they had time for anything but sex. But ideas and stories exploded within the walls of this villa like the most multiple of orgasms. Byron encouraged the others to dream and write ghost stories, leading Mary Shelley to write Frankenstein, and even Byron's personal physician wrote the influential novel The Vampire. And for Byron, the idea of poetry as an important force for change was reignited by Shelley. Do you think he was in love with Byron? Um, I think that that is going a little bit too far, but they definitely had the biggest friendship <laughs> crush on each other. <laughs> um, I mean, it's interesting that it was like this. Do you think you they know, had orgies together, like I, people said? I, I don't think so. I mean, it's Byron denies it. They all, you know, I, the thing that I love with Byron's denial of it is that he says it wasn't league of incest. They weren't actually sisters. They were stepsisters. Oh, right. uh, so he doesn't actually really get to the point. Many may have been titillated by the idea of a league of incest up at the villa, put about by one of Byron's enemies, but I think others must have just envied them. They lived outside the law, outside the rules of a strict society. Uh, okay, now we're going to pretend that there were English tourists in 1816 staying at the Hotel Angleterre over there. Okay. Uh, the proprietor's given us a pair of binoculars to look over there at Villa Diodati. To try and see where, some shagging. To see if there's some group shagging going on. Excellent. So we look at, hang on. Ah, oh, great Scott! <laughs> Marigold, don't look! <laughs> Byron is shagging Shelley. Mary's licking Claire. Oh, what? <laughs> no, 
Could be. <laughs> Have a look, my dear. Oh, I will. What can I... <laughs> Sorry, what? Let me hear I... I can't help but feel that with... No, I can't uh... help but feel either, darling. With um, 19th century uh, binoculars. You couldn't have seen very much. I couldn't have seen very much. Well, it must have been really fun if you were an English tourist, seeing if you could right. get, a, get a glimpse of it. What all the scandal hunters didn't know was that Claire Claremont was carrying what Byron called my little illegitimate. But this apparently shameful fact didn't seem to worry the free-loving circle of the Shelleys. It was an enchanted summer. And I think Shelley's friendship had a soothing effect on Byron. He changed, deepened as they spent their days exploring and boating, visiting places like this, the Chateau de Chillon. The prospect of Byron ever returning to England from exile was slight. Perhaps for this reason, he became obsessed with the story of one man who had been held here as a prisoner, the libertarian Francois Bonivard. A man who was... Um, holed up in a dungeon for three years. This absolutely tickled Byron's sense of himself. Byron was always the center of any drama, even if it was a drama about someone else. In one version of the 16th century story, Bonivar and his two brothers are chained together to the walls of the dungeon. Both Shelley and Byron really got off on the grimy details of these stories. You still see the ring. The castle's curator, Mercedes Guillaume, is showing me the very spot that inspired Byron's popular poem, The Prisoner of Chillon. He turns the story of Bonivar into really a story about himself and Shelley, kind of strapped to leg irons, both of them lashed to a wall, being beaten and whipped and everything like that. <laughs> and um, it's almost homoerotic, I find, the whole thing. But, you know, that's just me. Um, where is the, where's their signatures? Where is Shelley's? Just here. There it is, look. Mm -hmm. You missed the S. There's the S, just, you can see it. When, where's Byron? On this pillar, you can read his name. Actually, in the prison, you read it several times. So most probably, it is one of his admirers. Many English young ladies came with a book open in their hands to walk around the pillars, reading the poem, as the prisoner did. Really? Here we have Lord Byron's kind of acid trip Broadway musical version of um, the incarceration of the 16th century freedom fighter, Francois Bonivard. My hair is gray, but not with years, nor grew it white in a single night, as men's have grown from sudden fears. At last, men came to set me free I asked not why, and wrecked not where. It was at length the same to me, fettered or fetterless to be. I learned to love despair. With spiders I had friendship made, and watched them in their sullen trade. I'd seen the mice by moonlight play. And why should I feel less than they? My very chains and I grew friends. So much a long communion tends to make us what we are. Even I regained my freedom with a sigh. With the pregnant Claire Claremont and the Shelleys returning to England, Byron was once again a free agent. And he was soon to discover that too much freedom can be dangerous. Byron was now headed to a country where the attitudes to life, literature and love were so very different from the constraints of English morality and Swiss seclusion and plunged right into Milan's high society. Byron's beloved Napoleon was in exile and Italy was in flux. Milan was now under Austrian rule, filled with spies, intrigue and revolutionaries. Byron soaked up the febrile atmosphere. All the world's a stage. And Byron's life was an opera set upon it. As soon as he arrived, he took a box at La Scala, where everyone went to see and be seen. Maybe uh, people didn't know who Byron was when he first arrived, but the opera was the place where you made yourself known. The whole of society 
would be here on a regular basis, and uh, it only took one person to say, "Oh, questa è Lord Byron, or molto difficile." No, 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 no. And they've all done that, and then they'd have all known about the scandal, the incest, everything. And um, the point was, though, they weren't uh, so easily shocked by things. They let people, you know, kind of do what they liked. And it, uh, he remarks himself that uh, he was uh, introduced to a man who someone said, oh, this man prefers men. And the only reaction from society was, oh, what a, what a shame for the women. And so um, I think he must have known as soon as he got to Milan, this was kind of a, a, a great country for him to be in. For the cream of Italian society, Byron's scandalous reputation wasn't the handicap it had been in England. They all wanted him, and Byron lapped it up, charming the Donatella Versaces of his day. What I can say is, he wasn't a minimalist at all. No, not at all. It was extraordinary. Also, the way he looked physically, he was not handsome, according to what we consider handsome today. No. But then, it was considered very handsome. You know, when you think that a lot of people have smallpox, a lot of people didn't have teeth, uh, a lot of people had funny bones, so good-looking then was someone who had decent skin yes. and some teeth yes. uh, already. And so our, our standards have become so high, Very, in a very way. high. Uh, it's quite... We to have everything perfect. Can you imagine at that time already thinking about dieting and the perfect silhouette body? Well, that's a funny thing, because sometimes when you read things, it's like reading about things today. He loved, for example, some of his best friends were older women, but they did things like um, enemas and stuff like that. But anyway, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. Hi. Italy really was the great escape for Byron. The dinner is served. These flamboyant, tolerant and operatic people allowed him to be himself. And he left his mark here. Donatella and her daughter Allegra and their friends from the world of fashion are all familiar with his reputation. By the time it comes here, it's just an interesting parallel, in a way, because here, in a way, is one of the centres of image-making, uh, and you're all involved in the making of people's images. And he was so ahead of his time for that uh, kind of thing, about building image and being a star. Everything he did was star-like. You know how stars are really only friends with their hairdressers? Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Make a party to hairdressers. No, because the, you know in the end who's the important person around you. Yeah. And, and he was like that. He had this circus group of, of a gondolier and, uh, you know, his, his yeah. valet. And they were... Entourage. These were his... Hmm? These were his yeah. He just had his entourage and, and he was so like the first star. You know, like, because he had all these relationships, how maybe perhaps we thought it's because in the end he didn't really love himself, so he was looking for other people to love him. But that's another thing that he's very ahead of his time because this is a, a time before Freud. No one would understand that if you said to someone in 1816, do you hate yourself? Yeah. They just think it was very peculiar. Mm -hmm. And that's another very star-like thing. I think to be a star, mm -hmm. you have to have equal dose of hating yourself and loving the idea of yourself. Yes. Um, and that's why stars mostly today are so fucked yeah. up. Don't you think, in a way? I love myself. Mm -hmm. You yeah. love, yes. <laughs> <laughs> How they were the, the, the women with whom he was relating? The first one that really got him into trouble was this woman called Lady Caroline Lamb. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> she was like a dangerous woman because uh, once he rejected her, she went mad. And she had this fabulous scene once where she went to a party and she took a champagne glass and she cut her wrists at the party and said, OK, what do you want me to do now? Oh, that's so glamorous. Uh, fantastic. But in those days, in England, it was like the biggest. Everyone yeah. just stopped dead in their tracks. If Lord Byron was alive today, you think you go, you go to a psychiatrist in analysis, you'll be... I'm not sure, because I think he'd be... He, the thing about him also, he didn't care really what anyone else thought about him. And I think the idea of sitting in some psychiatrist's office and the psychiatrist saying, did your mother, you know, I don't know what they say, psychiatrist. I think he'd have got cross with the psychiatrist. I think psychiatrists are useless, though. Well, then. They never do anything, they just sit and listen. Anyway, if you're famous, doing interviews oh, is just like... Yeah. Uh, oh, is that it's, it's, it's like being a psychiatrist. Just say what you know. <laughs> And then after the interview, don't you find someone as you do an interview, you think, oh, my God, I really learned something about myself doing that. <laughs> <laughs> In Milan, Byron was carnally restrained. But like some great sexual athlete, he was merely pacing himself for his next city. Venice, 
where he would put in the groundwork for his next great poem, Don Juan, not least by seducing over 200 women. Byron had arrived in the city he was made for. In this place of masked balls and clandestine trysts in gondolas, Byron not only let his loins run wild, but also his creative genius. His stay in Venice was to inspire another epic poetic work, the scandalous masterpiece, Don Juan. As Byron had his guide, gondolier, and possible lover, Tito, I have my good friend Robin and her little pink boat. Can I bring my coffee on board? Of course. You can bring anything you like. I imagine Byron stalking in his gondola. He said everybody, rich, poor, young, old, they all loved sex in Venice uh, when he was here. So there must have been like this. And you think it's different now? Is it, is it the same now? No, it's, it's all anybody's interested in here. Really? Sex? Really, yeah. They like other things. They like well, going out know. on the boat. They like their food. They love drinking. Right. They love sex. drinking. They're the only Italians that drink, and they drink a lot. And Byron and uh, drank drink. quite a lot while he was here, too. As Robin says, everyone watches each other here. It's a sport. It always has been. Soon, Byron became a recognizable presence, lurking in the misty alleyways. Byron in the mist, yes, of course. <laughs> Eyes glowing with sexual desire, drip cocking, cock dripping with gonorrhea, <laughs> looking for the next moment of redemption through the misty canals, tendrils of smoky mist. And Tito is there always and taking Tito care of singing, <laughs> I think that um, Byron wanted to get away from all the attention he was getting in England, which was really negative. And getting a lot but of good he, attention but here. But he also didn't want to be ignored, because the thing is that it's very oh, no. easy to go from one extreme to the other, from, from the sense of being hounded to the sense of disappearing. And, um, and one is worse than the other. No, he I really think. found his picture frame here. I mean, he just, like, his image, I think, was completed in a way by Venice. And I remember actually uh, sitting on the Lido a couple mm. of summers ago with a very grand kind of group and mentioning your name. And one woman said, oh, yes, my husband has been having an affair with her for a long time. <laughs> Please tell her to come. And I thought, this is the ultimate in chic. <laughs> no names mentioned. No names it. mentioned. Okay. <laughs> um, well, n not many people work here. Oh, yes, actually. Robin. Yes, my husband has been having an affair with her for two years, I think. Isn't that so, darling? <laughs> Oh, yes, my dear, of course. Uh, we all know Robin, right? Everyone's all, oh, see? <laughs> I mean, in Byron's time, he said everybody uh, enjoyed the pursuit of sex here. Mm. And I guess that hasn't changed, really. Not really, no. Not as far as I've noticed. For Byron, Venice was a cheap place to live. He could and did have anything he wanted, from an odd menagerie of servants to the wife of his first landlord. But this wasn't just a voyage of excess. It was an exercise in freedom. And perhaps it was one way for him to vent his anger against what he called the cant political, cant poetical, and cant moral of the English and European worlds. And as ever, his life's experience was the raw material for his poetry, with his hero Don Juan fighting and shagging his way across the globe, apparently leaving his female conquests in ecstasy. She dreamed of being alone on the seashore, chained to a rock she knew not how, but stirred she could not from the spot. And the loud roar grew, and each wave rose roughly, threatening her. And o'er her upper lip they seemed to pour until she sobbed for breath. The dream changed, and in a cave she stood. Its walls were hung with marble icicles. Those are pubes, I expect. She's now inside her own pussy. Basically, what's happening here They've been having sex, they had a siesta. He started fucking her during the siesta while she was asleep. She dreams that, first of all, she's chained to a rock in a sea and the waves are crashing against her. Then she's suddenly inside her own vagina. This is all incredibly post-Freudian, which has icicles of marble all the way around. He has an orgasm, which are these dripping things that turn to marble. Then she wakes up to see him lifeless at her feet. So, you know, it's good pot-boiling dynasty stuff. This could be Joan Collins and Crystal Carrington. 
Venice was a diseased, indebted, collapsed world, betrayed by Napoleon and sacrificed to the stranglehold of the Austrian Empire. Its glorious days were well behind it, and like Byron, it would never be the same again. The city was a hotbed of subterfuge and decadence. Secret assignations, long nights roaming the canals, Byron fitted right in, a bejeweled rock star with his own costumed gondolier. Two barmaid girlfriends, shoals of anonymous masked sex partners, secret assignations in curtained gondolas against the walls of darkened courtyards in derelict marble hallways. Byron and Venice, for me, is the ultimate romantic image. By his evocative writings about Venice, and the exoticism of his presence, he revived an interest in its strange glamour. Byron the Wanderer thought he had found a sort of peace here. As he wrote, the city is decaying daily, however, here do I propose to reside for the remainder of my life. With his ancestral home, Newstead Abbey, at last sold, in May 1818, he took a lease on the Palazzo Monsenigo, a vast pile in prime position on the Grand Canal. His entourage was growing, and with 14 servants and a menagerie of animals, including two charming monkeys, Lord Byron moved in. Oh, God, it's beautiful, isn't it? The... Well, now I can show you the balcony. It's freezing cold. Yes, it's so humid. God, this but is the most this amazing is... spot. Yes, but the most incredible thing is that he had rented the whole of the palazzo, so he had both balconies. So the other, the other apartment too. Um, yeah. The whole thing. I don't know what he did with it, but anyhow. Well, he had uh, a, he had quite a big entourage of um, staff, yes, but I suppose they yes, lived upstairs, yes. did they? Yeah, generally, yes. So this is his studio, and uh, there's this famous, well-known print. But this but was he, Byron's, this was where he worked. Well, it? apparently, this is where he worked. I went through all his letters to Murray, mm. and uh, there's no says. evidence of where he slept. With whom, yes. Yes, but, but not where. <laughs> <laughs> but not, not, certainly not where. So where I don't worked. know in such a big house where, where his bedroom was. I haven't the faintest idea. Byron had an extraordinary energy in everything he did. He claimed to have slept with 200 women in his three years in Venice. One evening, he fell drunk into the canal while trying to seduce a young girl, and then, dripping wet, pulled himself out and had her on the balcony. But he always had a tendency to self-destruction. Shelley, uh, after visiting Byron in Venice, wrote, that Byron associated with wretches who seem almost to have lost the gait and physiognomy of man. <laughs> then he wrote that he was familiar with the lowest sort of woman, the people his gondoliers pick up in the street. He allows fathers and mothers to barter with him for their daughters. I think he was like a pig, probably, by the end of it. But I think it served a purpose for him. There was a sense of trying to shatter his uh, very Scottish Calvinistic foundation stones of his life and a need to, on the one hand, prove himself to be, you know, a fine, fantastically, you know, aristocratic matinee idol, but on the other hand, to destroy himself. And, you know, this is humanity's endless dilemma, encapsulated in Byron in a very kind of cartoon-like way. All of life was art to Byron. A visit to this anatomical museum with its preserved distortions of the human form was a bit off the beaten track for most travellers, but he found it fascinating. That he had gonorrhea is without doubt, but the fact that he wrote about syphilis in Don Juan suggests to me that he too might have been a sufferer. And here's the spotted dick, the syphilis. Yes, uh, this God. is a secondary syphilis. It's the, secondary yes, syphilis. The, the, the eruption there's, affects all the parts of the body anyway. There's a character in Byron's story called Kinnaird who um, wrote to Byron saying that he must take out all references to syphilis in his poem Don Juan. And I often wonder if Byron himself had syphilis because he had all these fits and, and uh, became gradually more and more insane during his life. 
Byron's fight with his publisher and others for the inclusion of references to syphilis in Don Juan was perhaps a bit of pioneering to banish the taboo of sexual diseases. God, I'm doing this on camera. And in the same spirit, I've decided to visit the local VD clinic. Now, this, you take the penis and so on. No. Today, it's all over relatively quickly. Ah! In it's Byron's terrible. day, things weren't quite so simple. <laughs> what I do for television, eh? Do you know about um, gonorrhea in the 19th century? Yeah, it's a, a common disease. Uh, there was a the therapy for this. So you just had it forever? No, yeah. But um, syphilis, on the other hand, did, did the mercury work? Was it a proper cure? Mercuria, era una cura, efficace, efficace? Poco efficace. It's strange, because sex is always, uh, you know, it's the thing everyone wants most, but it's yes. a killer. It's always been a killer, it seems to me. Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> but perhaps even for Byron, the relentless hedonism was in the end too much. One of his most touching poems indicates a distinct change of pace. So we'll go no more a-roving so late into the night, though the heart be still as loving, and the moon be still as bright. For the sword outwears its sheath, and the soul wears out the breast, and the heart must pause to breathe, and love itself have rest. He does truly seem to have given up on roving. He rediscovered politics, and settled into a particular sort of domestic entente with a married woman, Teresa Guiccioli. Their affair in Venice was more than the usual Byron fling and too flagrant even for a Venetian husband. Where shall I park my horse? So, Teresa was sent here by her husband. She was sent here by a very angry husband who got fed up with a very young and beautiful wife flirting around Venice with uh, Byron. And uh, in fact, he sends her down to Kazen and she comes here and she sulks. Basically. Maria Adelaide Avanzo's family have lived in this house since the Guiccioli's left. What's your take on uh, the Teresa Byron relationship then? Well, my take is, is that, A, I mean, she couldn't have possibly, in the beginning, have said no to such an opportunity because he was the symbol of romantic love, which was obviously the total passion in that epoch. And I think in the beginning she is totally infatuated with him. And then love for a yeah. while, passionate love. Well, they had sex and, uh, for four whole days. And he writes a letter to her, these corridors make me think of, about uh, reminding her how they've been having sex in the corridors and how exciting it was in corridors against walls, nearly being discovered by the staff. It's a difficult relationship to get a grip on. Yes. And my feeling is that... Um, he was so into his own image, and also he was kind of, he just turned 30, and he was having a, a kind of midlife crisis. He thought he couldn't go on having these, you know, terrible sexual antics, waking up with kind of half-dead syphilitic whores or with one leg. And so, like, in that typical kind of male midlife crisis thing, you think you can resolve everything with a relationship. And so he kind of plunged into this relationship with a girl who was really, I don't think, at all suited to him. Some people have brought it up to the stars, some people have made it into a terribly low relationship. But in fact, it was simply love between a poet and a beautiful girl who had a very strong practical sense. I agree with you there. And at the end, that practical sense is really what remains because he goes off to Greece because he's terrified of being caught and she remains, she cries a bit, and then she gets on with her life. He now had his final epiphany. The one relationship that mattered most to Byron came to a sudden tragic end. The Shelleys had joined him in Italy. Then Shelley drowned in a storm at sea. Byron took part in the cremation of his body on the beach at Viareggio. In Shelley's death, Byron's life took a new turn and he determined that, like Don Juan, he would take up arms and make the world a better place.
and of course, he would do so in a uniquely Byronic way. Byron must have looked into these flames and uh, thought, how can I trump this? On his first great foreign adventure in 1809, Byron had paid homage to the great classical culture whose literature and civilization he'd so admired since school days. His admiration for all things Greek had left a lasting impression. And now, 14 years later, he was determined to support his beloved Greeks in their fight for freedom from the Ottoman Empire. Excuse me, I'm looking um, for some military costumes. Military Resolving to join the Greek independence fighters, he decided to raise an army, but in a very Byronic way. I'm looking for um, hats that Lord Byron might have worn. In the later parts of Byron's epic poem, Don Juan becomes a soldier, and Byron was now determined to imitate his own creation. He decided to fit out himself and his motley band of friends, servants and distant relations in appropriately stylish military uniform and went to an operatic costume designer in Geneva to do so. In the back of his mind already is the legendary idea of Byron's brigade, freeing Greece from the clutches of the Ottoman Empire. A kind of power-hungry, syphilitic dream. I mean, that's what syphilis is like. It, it gives delusions of, of grandeur. And I sometimes wonder if he is, at this stage, syphilitic. It's such a crazy thing to be doing. I think he is seriously at the end of the road here, uh, trying on you know, costumes with epaulets to make him feel like the person he should be. I mean, he really is an actor. I mean, so it's, it's quite ironic that he ends up in a theatrical costume is, you know, choosing his outfit for the next act, for the uh, grand climax of this extraordinary life. Inspired by Napoleon, emulating Don Juan, flattered that he might be king, the lame boy had been transformed into a revolutionary hero. Sailing on his final adventure, Byron fantasized about a Greek republic with himself as leader, a nation in his own image, one to which he could finally belong. Byron was heading for here to take part in the war between Greece and Turkey. Um, he'd been sent by the London Greek Committee, um, who had promised a large amount of money, 800,000 pounds, which in those days was a lot. And he was basically coming to administrate it. Actually, they, they'd pulled the wool over his eyes slightly. He was really there just uh, as a kind of piece of ornamentation. He, of course, uh, wanted one last adventure slash death scene with which to propel himself into uh, posterity. Byron had hired a boy called Lucas to join the military enterprise and reverting to his youthful interests, he fell in love with him. But by now, Byron had lost his luster and Lucas was utterly indifferent. Come on. And it wasn't just on the personal side that Byron's aspirations were being confounded. He arrived at Missolonghi to find a degree of chaos, with various factions trying to make use of him and his fame. Byron protested that he didn't want to join a faction, but a nation. The Greeks still celebrate his support for their national cause, just this year naming an annual Byron Day. But for Byron himself, it was hardly heroic. In many senses, the nearer he got to Missolonghi, the more he wanted to go back, uh, but he couldn't let himself. Vanity, pride, this idea of his own um, posterity, I think was always in the back of his mind. And he had no way out, he was in a trap. Surrounded by disappointments and already in bad health, Byron went riding in a downpour through the malarial swamp of Missolonghi. He caught a fever and never recovered. So, Byron died here, on the edge of a swamp, at the fringes of the fray, his usual position, holding the hand of his Venetian gondolier. Wobbly-toothed, overweight, balding, no longer mad, bad and dangerous to know, just mad, perhaps, to even be here in the first place. Hopelessly in love with an arrogant boy, 
disillusioned with his brothers in arms, far away from all the friends so studiously shunned over the years, but who he missed nonetheless. Byron's death was a million miles away from history's portrait that he so earnestly helped to construct. The final glaze was painted with his own blood. At the age of 36, the shooting star had shot. Byron's body was embalmed in a vat of brandy and began the arduous journey back to his ancestral home in Nottinghamshire. Finally, I returned to his hometown after following Byron on the extraordinary adventures that took him abroad for half his adult life. He's still a hero to the Greeks, the Albanians and others. But what does he mean to us today? Good evening, welcome to the Byron. If you'd like to get that eight-page marathon book ready, just down the road from his ancestral home, I find the name of Byron is still alive. He championed the rights of these people's ancestors, the weavers of Nottingham, in his maiden speech in the House of Lords. Who oh, wants sources to someone? Three and nine, thirty-nine. Do you any of you ladies know much about Byron, for example? I mean, does everyone here know things about him? Or? I don't know a lot. I only know he was a poet and he was a bit of a lad. This one he? knows he was a sex maniac. Well, she was. Well, she, she was. was. Generation. She generation. You know, like in 1933, mm -hmm. two vicars um, opened up the crypt. He was perfectly preserved. But the second thing was he had a gigantic <laughs> erection. <laughs> well, that's about and right, Byron. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Low to sex to me. That's the weird thing. He had a, a tiny foot and a huge cock. Very difficult to live with those two. That that. Nature equates. I know exactly. Nature equates. Yeah, you wish you had a little foot. <laughs> no, I wish I had a big cock. Well, you had a little foot. You dirty bugger! You, you dirty old oh, bugger! Don't be so. I can't believe you said that. What? I can't believe you said that either. What, that he wished he had a big cup? I never said that. Well, he can dream, <laughs> can't he? He's only imagining what he'd love to have. <laughs> he wants to wrap it round his waist trap twice and then tuck it in his trousers. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies, shall we go on with the bingo now? <laughs> We all think we know something about Byron. Who was he really? A cripple? A queer? An aristocrat? A revolutionary? Crippled certainly by shyness when it suited him, and possibly arrogant in the next breath. Brilliantly inconsistent. He was loved and hated with equal fervor. The vast, epic nature of Byron's story can make him remote. But for me, it's his inglorious death and the ultimate failures in his life that make him touching and touchable. And it's for those frailties that I love him. <laughs>